community, and to the organizers. We're honored to participate. Taiwan is a democracy lab inspiring people all over the world and demonstrating that more responsive forms of governance are possible. Democratic governments around the world are dominated by factions. Members of these factions are elected, but the factions themselves are institutionalized organizations that persist for decades. The factions were the design constraint for democratic forms of government. To say it a different way, founders tried to protect against both majority and minority factions, and political philosophers and founders of representative democracies throughout antiquity were preoccupied with the harmful potential for factions, warning of their rise as a kind of sickness of the social body. Aristotle wrote about them in politics, Plato in the Republic. They were part of the justification for national government in the United States in Madison and Hamilton's Federalist 9 and 10. And warnings against factionalism formed the central theme in George Washington's farewell address after his presidency. And this position was not limited to Western political philosophers of antiquity. Political philosophers during the Song Dynasty, as well as passages in the Analects, admonished leaders to avoid factional behavior as well. Politics dominated by factions plays out in one dimension, left, right, and center. This dominant narrative is constructed by considering a small handful of positions on a small handful of issues. The reality on the ground in our democracies is always much different. In democracies worldwide, billions of citizens hold an untold number of interests, opinions, and positions. Political reality on the ground is vastly more complex than our political symbols and categories allow us to express. Our political choices are artificially constrained by existing abstractions that either compress us into just two large opposing parties, or in the case of proportional representation systems, a mix of smaller parties. Either way, the real complexity of people's opinions is squashed. There are thousands of overlapping groups, not just two tribes. There are hundreds of thousands of issues and sub-issues, not the small handful the media focus on during election cycles. Elections and referendums severely constrain the information that populations are able to send to governing bodies. Our current methods of compressing the will of the masses into party platforms, for example, leave out in the United States, 42% who now identify as independents and whose voices are excluded from the policy formation process at every step. The numbers are about the same in the United Kingdom. This is especially true after Brexit. According to the independent, quote, millions of voters feel politically homeless and would consider backing a new center ground party. Almost half of those questioned said both that they did not feel represented by any established party and that a new organization would have a chance of winning their vote. End quote. As a democratic population, what we see is heavily influenced by what our representations allow us to see. Political parties are like a very low resolution photograph. They obscure critical aspects of what voters might actually want or what they would be willing to accept. Making things worse, party platforms cast off consensus issues in favor of wedge issues useful for gaining power. The Brexit referendum alternatively wrapped up thousands of issues into a binary vote and created a new lens, leave or remain, through which to see the, the, uh, the polity. The scourge of polarization and deadlock in modern politics is a function of our mechanisms for simplifying citizen input like these. It's not a feature of our constitutions, our government structures, or our populations. It's an information problem. We live along one political dimension because our categories for expressing ourselves and our tools for thinking about ourselves and others are one-dimensional. Democratic forms of government worldwide are still shortchanging their opportunities to enhance issue-based democratic policymaking. As a result, there is enormous pressure to discuss every issue during an election cycle, a process that predictably leaves citizens feeling unsatisfied and the government without a discernible mandate. We need more scalable compression mechanisms for making better meaning of rich qualitative data that citizens can and will provide. Processing inputs of this scale is not a new problem to data science. Netflix, for instance, drives production decisions by using automated data collection and analysis. The company looks at the behavior of its expansive TV and movie watching population and uses that data to suggest other shows to viewers as well as to inform decisions about what new shows to produce. The results of these analyses have overturned conventional thinking inside Netflix about who would want what. Interviewed for Variety magazine in 2017, Netflix VP of product Todd Yellen said, quote, 
Netflix used to recommend content based on the region that its users were in, following the general school of thinking that subscribers in South America probably would prefer different fare than subscribers in Canada. But upon looking closer at the data, the company realized that this wasn't actually true. We find that to be greater and greater nonsense, and we're disproving it every day, he said. Instead, Netflix now divides up its subscriber base into 1,300 taste communities, which are solely based on past viewing behavior. Each and every user can belong to multiple such communities, and all of these communities spread across the globe. Sure, Yellen admitted, German comedians may be more popular in Germany, but there's also plenty of users in the U.S. who turn into their shows. A big part of personalization is finding taste communities globally. The result of these data analyses that Netflix did are categories far more niche than the one-dimensional flatland of comedy and drama. In fact, Netflix breaks movies up into 76,000 categories, like scary cult movies from the 1980s, brain food docs, and fight the system TV shows. Movies can belong to multiple categories, just like viewers can belong to multiple taste communities. For Netflix, the goals are clear. Better recommendations and more views mean higher customer engagement and thus retention. The more valuable the platform is, the more likely people are to recommend it, and new customers are to join. Now that Netflix and the rest of us can look more accurately at the signals created by large populations, we're all seeing more details and finer-grained categories that describe us. Netflix can see a lot more of the preferences of their customer base because they have rendered a more detailed portrait of the complex preference space. And it came from the population itself, rather than pre-existing notions and assumptions. They changed their minds based on observations of emergent behavior, scientifically. If Netflix presupposed there were only a handful of categories, comedy, drama, horror, war, sports, that would define the resolution it would see its users, and also define the resolution at which it considered which content to produce. It would also influence the resolution at which its users would see themselves, and the language its users would have to describe themselves. Today I want you to imagine the public had, anonymously or semi-anonymously, that same fine-grained continual awareness of the complexity of public opinion across all issues. Even issues the government isn't aware of or ready to yet consider. Imagine if the public transparently understood itself with as much granularity as Netflix understands the movie watching subscriber base it has, with 1,300 taste preferences and 76,000 genres. Democracy has some thousands of interest groups and hundreds of thousands of issues and sub issue areas. What might it offer us to make meaning of our political spaces? of ourselves as a body of citizens, as a whole, in more dimensions and in higher resolution. Who would produce these emergent maps of public opinion for the public? After nearly a decade of work, we have some hints. There's one easy answer, though, not political parties. Parties, factions, have seen the public in higher resolution, as many clusters and subclusters, for a long time. And they don't like to share that information with those they represent. Organizationally, they're prone to hide it. And why wouldn't they? They're building big tents, and they lose power if they themselves split apart into smaller factions. The Office of Presidential Correspondence under President Obama's administration gave us a glimpse of a data source and a process of listening to voices at scale in the long periods between elections. During Obama's tenure, the White House received roughly 10,000 letters per day from ordinary people. They were read by a rotating group of 300 volunteers and a handful of dedicated staff who selected 10 letters for the president to read each day. The 10 letters were chosen as a best compromise, broadly representative of the population's thoughts and feelings, while accepting that he couldn't possibly read and digest the full spectrum of what was pouring in. They were the result of a kind of compression algorithm run by a particularly empathic, qualitatively oriented human computer fed a raw input of the population's agenda in its own words. This was a process deeply rooted in respect for the human voice. This practice is not common, however. About two years ago, I spoke with an individual on the staff of one of the major departments in the U.S. federal bureaucracy. The department was facing a public comment period in which they were expecting nearly one million comments. There was a single federal employee tasked with reviewing and summarizing the one million plain text comments. 
The same process would see input from focused industry lobbyists. And this was not, despite earnest efforts by public servants who didn't have enough resources, it was not a process rooted in respect for the human voice. And it is unfortunately much closer to the status quo for the handling of qualitative citizen input. In contrast, part of what made Be Taiwan so inspiring to so many people around the world was that it demonstrated a scalable, repeatable, efficient process for integrating citizen voices into policymaking processes. It demonstrated that public servants could find breakthrough consensus while taking one issue at a time. V Taiwan demonstrated both that there are better ways to listen to and represent groups in conflict, and that these representations can be meaningfully integrated into policy processes and lead to better policy outcomes. V Taiwan as a process was located within government where policy was being created, rather than that issue being one more issue loaded onto a binary signal at the ballot box or put to referendum, as referendums themselves are prone to get overloaded and hijacked because they're ultimately just binary votes. It put public servants and citizens at the center rather than politicians facing election. The full dimensionality of the issues was allowed to unfold and a map of citizen positions was created at the outset rather than citizens up or downing a fully baked proposal. We're not going to overcome institutionalized factions without new models that enable citizens to imagine what governance looks like without factions. And that's one large benefit of many of the new forms of citizen assemblies popping up all over the world. They expand our collective imaginations as citizens about what is possible, short, medium, and long term. When I had the opportunity to speak at GovZero's summit in Taiwan in 2016, I had the pleasure to announce uh, that Polis was going to become open source. And now I have the pleasure of announcing that the software will be sustained by a nonprofit organization. It's called the Computational Democracy Project, the mission of bringing data science to deliberative democracy worldwide, continuing the open source work that has been done over the past decade to make new tools and techniques available to the public. As machine learning methods advance, we will continue to work to build tools that integrate data science methods into tools the public can use to better understand and communicate itself, and we'll make those available. POL.is, as the main hosted instance of the Polis platform, is now open to nonprofit organizations of all kinds all over the world to log in and begin using in full today, supported by CompTEM. CompTEM has also published a robust and growing knowledge base regarding the best practices for the methodology. Together, these represent all an organization needs to implement and derive value from the methodology. We're now supporting efforts all over the world at every level of government, as well as efforts by newsrooms, academics, nonprofits, foundations, and movements. Involving citizens directly in policymaking is growing more timely. Highly factionalized governments are not effective at meeting the increasingly complex demands of fast-moving, global-scale existential issues like climate change that require mandates for bold action. We need political machines that work for the public. Thousands of years ago, the Greeks devised political machines to avert faction. The Claritarian implemented an algorithm that generated a random selection of citizens that put citizens in positions of real agenda-setting power. What might we accomplish as civic technologists over the next 100 years? It's time to ask big questions about what governance might look like over that time frame if we can collectively answer loud calls to rebuild the foundations of our democracies around participation. New capabilities for reconciling complexities at scale in democ democratic populations mean new assumptions regarding the representation of populations. Future democratic systems must be much more effective at managing and integrating qualitative signals from the population at scale to avoid polarized deadlock. Systems of representation of representative government were intentionally designed to break the back of faction. Crippled by faction, we as democratic populations should honor that tradition and keep designing. Okay, thank you, Colin. Colin, can you hear me? Hi there, yes, I can hear you. Hi, uh, we have one question on Slido. It says, what's your opinion on personal data protection and how UK government are doing to protect it. Thanks so much for that question. Uh, personal, da personal data protection uh, has to be a priority at every step. Uh, 
I would highlight now that the government of Taiwan has brought the technology onto its own hardware and servers um, and fully controls uh, fully controls the the software um, deployment uh, by keeping the software in the um, uh, licensed in a uh, in a GPL3 and in the open source uh, and continuing to monitor deployments of the technology um, to ensure that it's uh, being deployed in an ethical manner. Um, the nonprofit plans to continue to monitor uh, the usage of individual data, not only on our own deployments, but in the ecosystem at large as well. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, your, your speech is very ins enlighten us on uh, how government collect data and uh, how uh, police system help Free Taiwan uh, collect and uh, communicate with people online. Thank you for your speech. Uh, do we have any questions here? Anyone? What we have? Yes. So hello. Uh, I want to ask that uh, after the UK like leave the UN, is there any change uh, about the attitude or the policy of the open government? Great, great question. I've been in contact with people in the United Kingdom in the civic technology community, in the government itself, and in the nonprofit foundation think tank sector for perhaps six or seven years now. My sense is yes. It is difficult to make a an observation at a distance about why I do believe there is more excitement, interest, passion, and dedication towards the application of civic technology in the interest of innovating democratic systems in the United Kingdom after Brexit. But personally, I believe this is a result of the application of referendum as such. So many decisions about the future of the policy and the lives of people in the UK were put up to a binary vote. And so, so many issues of consequence have followed as a result of that binary vote. It demonstrates that governments are very interested in understanding the public. They need the legitimacy that the public offers, but simultaneously the tools at which they go out to, to the public uh, and to bring their voices in are quite limited. And the difference between the need for legitimacy and the power of the legitimacy that a referendum can offer, and yet the troublesome implications of a referendum that covered so many issues simultaneously um, offers a very powerful case of reducing the voice of the public to such a small amount of information and having it and giving it such leverage to affect policy downstream. This is my view on why the United Kingdom has become more interested over time and especially after Brexit uh, in implementing democratic reforms uh, uh, and, and will continue to do so over the next decade. Okay, thank you, Colin. Uh, we have two more questions on Slido. Uh, you see that? The first is, I do see those questions. Yes, the, the first is you mentioned that Netflix uses uh, taste preference to categorize attitudes. So can you talk a little bit more about it? Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to talk more about that. I think that we can consider uh, every instance of a recommender engine a kind of collective intelligence. It's an application of machine learning algorithms that moderate uh, or uh, 
augment our understanding of how, um, how we relate to each other. Netflix's application of this technology at scale has revealed far finer grained understanding of the, uh, of, um, of their users. Um, I think that this demonstrates, uh, concretely, um, in a very similar way that Spotify's, uh, usage ha has, has demonstrated uh, that we can discover very new things about ourselves by evaluating emergent phenomenon, phenomenon that um, that we're not that are not necessarily asking for at the outset. In other words, to take uh, to reference the previous conversation about Brexit, we are not asking, do you like rock music or jazz music, and then offering people uh, uh, music based on their responses. Spotify is looking even at the raw audio waveforms. This means that in Spotify's case, even a musician who has never been listened to by any, artist, by any other uh, um, user of the platform, uh, someone who has uploaded a new recording, a new album, those waveforms can be matched uh, to all of the other um, musical preferences uh, of, of all of the music that someone has listened to. This is a stunning example of the application of machine learning to, um, to cluster music uh, and then offer that to the, um, uh, to use that as a discovery platform, to, to, to use that as a collective intelligence um, uh, 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 mediation of, of people and the way that relate to each other. The idea that our legislatures uh, are themselves intended to be collective intelligences and the idea that the way that our legislatures are collective intelligences is because they are themselves mini publics, deliberative bodies that are supposed to discuss things in public, transparently, um, out in the open, Rather than, uh, rather than just handing the public, instead of rock music or jazz music, left or right, um, I, I think that this provides a, a robust metaphor for seeing more people and potentially leveraging more, um, more of the uh, participation that people are willing to engage in over time. Uh, and I believe that the, the, the effects of many publics will eventually be to challenge the state of legislatures as they exist as collective intelligences in democratic systems. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, but I think this is a harder one. Is there any change about the policy or attitude about the open government before and after the UK leave UN United Nations? Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, Colin, uh, you want to say anything else to the audience? No. I will simply say thank you to thank thank you to you all for for having us again at at uh, the Gov Summit, uh, and we really appreciate it. And also thank you to the translators um, and those who are uh, um, those who are signing and making the talk accessible. Okay, thank you, thank you, Colin. Uh,那各位呃，大家我们上半场的。一程就到这边结束，是不是也再次谢谢大家的手？感谢我们今天所有呃工作人员，口译老师、手译老师，谢谢大家今天上午的参与，谢谢。哦，啊，we have one more questions. Colin still there? Uh, data analysis and uh, ML require many choices uh, in part of engineer. So how to manage? Uh, how to manage me in part, uh, sorry, transparent way. OK, 
Okay, you there? Ah, I'm still yeah. here. Is this um, what? One more? Is this question for me? Yes, I, I believe so. <laughs> okay, great. I will say that one of the points Audrey uh, Audrey Tang has emphasized over time is that Polis, in particular, uses rather old machine learning algorithms which are deterministic. Uh, principal components analysis, for instance, really only takes um, the number of, of uh, the number of components. K-means takes the number of clusters. Uh, so, and they can be compared to each other. So there are fewer hyperparameters. But it's true. As we get into more, um, as we get into more uh, detailed uh, analysis of clustering, for instance, especially using newer forms of graph-based uh, graph algorithms, there, there, uh, how many clusters have been chosen uh, can be arbitrary, and so this has to be uh, done in a transparent manner. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that we have published and are maintaining notebooks um, that multiple uh, data scientists from the community uh, should also be able to run against open data. If we have a process that includes open algorithms and open data and an open platform and methods, then the community itself can, um, can provide an end-to-end -end, uh, check or analysis um, on, uh, on the, 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 asp the data science enabled aspects of any methodologies and processes. Uh, this is very important uh, in our view to uh, le uh, lending confidence to the application of data science to uh, deliberative processes. Uh, sorry about that, Colin. We have one more question. Of course. Are you concerned about the risk that individual data could be re-identified and used for individual political uh, manipulation? Yes. That's a good one. That's I will say more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that we, we, have, we have done our best uh, as an organization over the course of the past decade to steer the, the usage and application of the technology towards those who are going to do so in the public interest. And it is, of course, part of the motivation for becoming a nonprofit um, and being able to steward the technology over time. In the long run, of course, any technology will be applied um, for any use. There is no real ability in the long term to limit the application or use of technology. Um, but I believe that there is, uh, there is power in creating a culture around technology of applying it towards the public good. In part, this can create a reference for how a technology should be, or at least could be used, um, and also provides a reference to those who would participate uh, to hold those who gather data um, accountable for being responsible with their voices. Fundamentally, I think this comes down to treating the voice of citizens with respect in participatory processes. And this is, um, this, this, this is in part uh, counting, um, counting their voices um, as a part of the process. This is in part making their voices more meaningful and bringing them in uh, to the processes in, 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 a, in a way that, um, that, that, that changes the, uh, the policies. But this is also um, respecting the process by which they are brought in and the identity of the participants throughout uh, and including end-to-end including -end data management. Um, we will do our best to, to, to promote best practices and monitor um, applications or potential abuses of the technology. Uh, but I think that the, um, the culture that is being created around the application of the technology is the most powerful asset we have. Okay, uh, thank you once again. I want to thank you, Colin. I want to thank you all the speakers, Yi uh, and uh, uh, our Zuo Wei Yuan. 那上午的这个场次我必须因为时间的关系要在这边截止 because the time constraint I have to be stopped here 接下来的时间我交给一成组